I want to welcome everybody to the annual keynote talk of the Beatrice Bain Research Group, or the BBRG for short. Um, it's Berkeley's Center for Research on Gender and Women. I'm Paola Baqueta, the, a professor in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies and director of the BBRG. I'm going to introduce our speaker, Gayatri, uh, Professor Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, in just a moment. But first, I want to thank all of our co-sponsors, and there are very many. We're very happy about that. Um, first and foremost, we'd, we'd like to thank the Department of Gender and Women's Studies and the Lee Ka Shing Foundation for their generous support. We also want to thank the designated emphasis in women, gender, and sexuality, the Townsend Center for the Humanities. We thank the designated emphasis in critical theory, and in particular, Judith Butler, for their support. We'd like to thank the following departments, comparative literature, rhetoric, sociology, South and Southeast Asia studies, English, and geography. And we thank the following research centers, Center for South Asia Studies, Center for Race and Gender, Center for the Study of Sexual Cultures, and we want to thank also the graduate students who worked on this, in particular the Townsend Center Working Group on Muslim Identities and Cultures, and especially Humadar and Tala Hanmalek. We want to thank the organizers of the conference on decolonizing the university, especially Professor Nelson Maldonado Torres, who worked to integrate Professor Spivak's lecture into the conference. And so thanks to his efforts and the efforts of many others the, in, during these two days, our campus gets to be the site of the convergence of some uh, intense decolonial, critical race, post-colonial, and transnational feminist and queer theorizing. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome everyone who's come from the conferences also. Um, I also want to acknowledge the presence of our Dean of Social Sciences, Professor Carla Hesse. We're grateful her, for her intellectual interest in and support of the BBRG. And finally, I want to thank the BBRG's managing staff person, um, Jillian Edgelow, without whom really this event could not have taken place. And I want to thank Jenny Morales, also the BBRG work-study student, for all her help. Now, to introduce Professor Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak. Well, obviously, for most of you, she needs no uh, introduction at all. I think probably for all of you. And uh, we all know she's a leading theorist in many areas of scholarship, in literary studies, cultural studies, post-colonial studies, continental philosophy, and transnational feminist studies. She doesn't actually identify with all of those, so I can <laughs> but anyway. Um, <laughs> So here at Berkeley, her books, articles, interviews, translations are all taught across many interdisciplines and across many disciplines as the range of co-sponsors of this talk uh, that span the humanities and social sciences that certainly indicates. Um, professor Spivak um, was appointed to the highest rank of university professor at Columbia University in 2007. She's also director of Columbia's Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. Uh, Professor Spivak was born in Calcutta, West Bengal, on the 24th of February, 1942. So we wish her a happy birthday. Uh, she's written quite a bit about her own formation and her positionings as points of departures for various interrogations and reflections. Uh, and so, you know, I think most mostly many people have read that. Um, I, I, she has a long list of honorary research residencies, honorary teaching posts, honorary doctorates, faculty awards, and so I won't go into all of it uh, at the moment. Uh, her work's been translated into many, many languages on, in all regions of the world. And um, I want to just say that it, the, the task of introducing her is daunting because I received a, a, um, a list of her publications that was more than 50 pages long. So obviously I don't have time to mention everything. In fact, I don't even have time to list everything. Uh, so I just want to do two things. I'll mention a few of the books and, and major publications and also try and uh, just bring out a few of the points that, uh, that many of us have found very salient. Uh, really, we found everything very salient, so that's also difficult. But um, let's just say that after her first book, which was on Yeats, in, uh, Professor Spivak produced an English translation of, of Jacques Derrida's 1967 classic book, De la Gra Grammatologie, 
of grammatology. And, and her critical introduction to that book, of course, has been spoken about a lot. Um, most of you, have, I hope, have read it. It is widely uh, considered to be a, a, a standard setter for these kinds of introductions. And she's also published in other worlds, Essays in Cultural Politics, The Postcolonial Critic, Thinking Academic Freedom, Engendered Postcoloniality, which was published in South Africa, Outside the Teaching Machine, The Spivak Reader, Imperatives to Reimagine the Planet, A Critique of Postcolonial Reason, Death of a Discipline, What is Gender, Where is Europe, Walking with Balibar, Conversations with Gayatri Spivak, Other Asia, Asias, and she has joint authored a book with Judith Butler entitled Who Sings the Nation State. She has a number of forthcoming books, which I won't mention, or will be here all day, and uh, translations from Bengali into English by uh, work by Mahasweta Devi, and also uh, Ram Prashad. She has over 225 articles, so obviously I will not name them all. Uh, many of you have, have really looked very closely at her 1988 article, Can the Subaltern Speak? It, was, um, it appears in many anthologies in English uh, and in translation in both full and e extract form. It's the object of Professor Spivak's own continued reflections in notorious interviews such as the one entitled Subaltern Talk or as part of the history section of her book, A Critique of Postcolonial Reason, or as a part of her various lectures, including a one at Columbia University entitled, interestingly, The Trajectory of the Subaltern in My Work. Now, instead of uh, merely describing this work, which is uh, impossible, I want to just point out uh, some of her main ideas. For example, in relation to postcolonial theory, and especially through a critique of it, um, Spivak, Professor Spivak brings us concepts such as unlearning one's privilege as one's loss, uh, at the notion of sanctioned ignorance, the notion of an enabling violation, uh, two different ways of thinking about representation, either as proxy, political proxy or as portrait. She brings us in the realm of subaltern studies uh, a distinct notion of the subaltern that is not really derived from the reading of Antonio Gramsci, but, um, but rather of Guha's reinterpretation of the subaltern in relation to South Asian history. And um, it, she has continually refined this notion over and over again. And recently, I mean, a lecture that I recently saw, she talked about the subaltern as a positionality without a subject. In fact, uh, we all know that she's been concerned with the ethics of an impossible experience of an encounter with the subaltern as an inaccessible other. And um, she, her notion of epistemic violence is something that people have used here as well. In transnational feminist theorizing, she has uh, critiqued a number of claims of Western feminism, such as, for example, the claim to speak for all women, the Western feminist notion of global sisterhood, uh, which generally proceeds by erasing global to local relations of power. Um, and also she's critiqued the paternalistic and maternalistic question by dominant feminism, what can I do for them, which presupposes this binary we, they, etc., and reproduces certain types of, sa of savior narratives um, and the assignment of benevolent agency to the dominant we and victimization and passivity to the they that is imagined as already uh, always already more oppressed than thou. Um, she has really uh, also brought us the notion of, inf uh, well, a whole discussion around information retrieval or the practice of extracting and importing so-called knowledge of the so-called third world into the first world where it can get arranged into a particular type of grid of intelligibility in ways that might unproductively detach it from its context. Uh, the notion of the strategic use of positive essentialism, which has uh, been, of course, the focus of a lot of controversy, and the notion of white men saving brown women from brown men as the conditions of a colonial savior narrative, but also as very timely in relation to, for example, Afghanistan. Um, I guess I just want to mention that Professor Spivak uh, has focused her attention on political economy, the international division of labor, globalization throughout all of her work, whether it's in the literary, philosophical, or other realms. And I, I'm going to end now, but before I do, I just want to mention that um, I've often wondered whether or not a litmus test for social and critical theories usefulness for our world could be 
to ask ourselves to what degree uh, does this or that theory or this or that con concept um, become compatible with capitalism, with genocide, with racism, with slavery, with colonialism, with queer phobia, with sexism, and so on. And, um, I, and with this in mind, I want to say that one of the great pleasures for me of reading Professor Spivak and of hearing her um, is in the extreme rigor of her critiques and in her constant effort to revisit and revise her critiques that always provide for us an opening towards something else. So it's no exaggeration for me to say that I think she's among the most brilliant living scholars on our planet. Please join me in welcoming to our campus uh, Professor Gayatri uh, Chakravarti Spivak, who will speak to us on situating feminisms. Thank you. I know the bottle of water would be small. <laughs> I know. Listen, really, thank you so much for turning up. I mean, the sun is out. You know, this is your last chance. When it was, when it was raining, it's understandable. You want to be out of the rain. But, you know, Friday evening, sun's out. Well, don't tell me I didn't warn you. Thank you so much, Paula. You've already summarized me so, uh, so well that I'm going to repeat myself, but that's okay. I sometimes uh, think that some of the things I've thought bear repeating. Wh which way did you ask me to, uh, Gillian, which way did you want me to do the, the mic? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, Yes, I'm not going to say anything new. It, I, I'm quite serious about that. The, um, I uh, am actually going to repeat something which is not always remembered, or perhaps I didn't make myself clear, um, about that old essay, which now is getting a lot of purchase in Europe. Can the subaltern speak? And they're beginning to think that uh, the, the subaltern can stand in as any woman who suffers and so on. I want to say that what I had really tried to uh, uh, do in that essay, which was very hard for me to write, very hard for me to write, was to notice that because, and this relates to something we were talking about this afternoon, it, uh, that because neither the... Um, good British guys who made, uh, who criminalized Sati, nor uh, the good Hindu reformers who uh, wanted, who, uh, who joined with the British, uh, because, and nor yet, the, it's a critique of the Hindus, right? It's not really an anti-colonial essay. Um, and uh, nor yet the old Hindus, because none of them really touched the subject formation of the women concerned just passed good laws. In fact, in uh, the 80s, it was possible for Roop Kaur's mother, I mean, the woman who had uh, made herself a sati, um, self-immolated widow, it was possible for Roop uh, Kaur's mother to smile because she felt that this was, and this is something that uh, we feminists had great difficulty coming to terms with. So it really is that lesson over again. And I would like to tell you something else also, which is that the white men are saving brown women from brown men. That sentence rhetorically was there because I did not know enough about South Asia. I said so in the essay. I said that I must turn this into a sentence now so that I can proceed. After that, I've made it my business to get much more involved in the last 20 years or so and more with uh, subalternity in India and elsewhere, but that was the beginning. And so therefore, being a reader, I needed a sentence. And I, so that's all it is. 
it's not it's not the it's not the, uh, the, the 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 heart of the essay or anything it is needed when you're ignorant remember that one it's much too general the and it is really also a racist remark but uh, what i also want to say is that I, much much later i saw some uh, maybe 5 years ago I, or maybe not even five years ago, I saw that I, I said there that I took that sentence as a monetary model from Freud, like Freud's sentence, a child is being beaten, I wanted to make a sentence. What was I doing? I was turning to a white man, Freud, in order to save the brown women who were getting on the, uh, on the, on the cheetahs to be burnt from brown men. So I realized with amusement that people who have taken me to the cleaners saying, I'm a subaltern, you denied me a voice, completely misunderstanding what I was writing about, never noticed that I had done something really quite alarming. Even, <laughs> even, you know, so I present it to you now because the way to read that essay is to notice that it is written by an ignorant person who, want, who then went further on to do something about the ignorance rather than wait there, and also to say that what there was in there, I'm still working on. It's going to be a repetition that if you do not involve yourselves with subject production, and I've called it yesterday an aesthetic education. In other words, it's an old, I'm a Europeanist, it's an old European term, sabotage that phrase, that phrase um, for me, means an, a, a training of the imagination for epistemological performance. So this uh, is all that I'm going to say. It's an incredibly inconvenient thing to do. Nobody will do it. But on the other hand, I will have to say it because uh, like other people before me, I want to get on the dollar bill. I cannot tell a lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please remember, I'm in the Du Bois Gramsci tradition. I believe in an aesthetic education for everyone. By aesthetic education, I mean training the imagination for epistemological performance. I start with a story. The triumph of the Euro-specific, even Anglo-specific model, Mary Wollstonecraft, embedded in the history of both capitalism and Marxism, traveling through coloniality and globalization with a strong missionary impulse at work. I take this as given, and I expect that most of you know this story already. My speech is over. This is what it is to situate feminism. But then, as Paula quite correctly said, and again also because I am a literary uh, person, I speak about uh, uh, stereotypes of myself a good deal. And so therefore, I, uh, let me situate my stereotype of myself. Someone should tell Slavoj Žižek this, <laughs> that, you know, that it's not a bad idea. It's not narcissistic. It's not coming down from heaven. Uh, let me situate my stereotype of myself as a middle-class Calcutta girl in the 50s. Feminism was in the air among the smart literary set when I was coming into my own in the 1950s in Calcutta. I belong to the group now which thinks that text is a web or a weaving, including the web of what one calls a life. Thus, this phenomenon marking, quote, feminism in the stereotype of my life is, to me, textual. One could put it in a more and less understandable way by saying that feminism, probably the English word, was not for me a bookish affair, although one was constantly naming books, especially the second sex, which I didn't read until I came into the United States three years into the United States, but one was always talking about the second sex. <laughs> I now realize that something not specifically called feminism was woven into that web by my parents, who were proto-feminists insofar as, bearing some opprobrium from the larger family, they brought the girls up exactly like the boy, 
emphasizing intellectual achievements rather than preparation for marriage. Our greatest source of pride was that our mother, unlike the women of her class and generation, had earned a master's degree in Bengali literature in 1937 when she was 24. Father died when I was 13. He had been insistent in recognizing me and my sisters and mother, and perhaps women in general, as agents. I was in practice a thoroughgoing woman-for-woman -woman person by age 15 when mother released me from the possibility of an arranged marriage. She showed me by her example how to be such a thing through her indefatigable work to establish a working women's hostel in the Calcutta of the 50s and 60s, as well as her hard work with other women's organizations for travel and moral uplift, for the employment of destitute widows, and what can only be called undercover work towards the establishment of the first institutional Ramakrishna Mission nunnery, finding interim habitations for intellectual women who wanted to leave patriarchal life for whatever reason. Once again, I wasn't reading a book, but I was intertextually involved in the making of a life. Feminist intuitions implicit in the direct family and feminist positioning explicit in the peer group. The first influential text was probably Engels, Origin of the Family. A close second was Betty Friedan, the feminine mystique, but that was simply because as an assistant professor in my 20s, I was asked to introduce her to a crowd larger than this, even counting the outside. I was scared to death, a crowd of thousands at the University of Iowa in the mid-1960s. After that, it's hard to say what influenced me. I was doing feminism, producing feminist texts before I could recognize an influence. Sixu's laugh of the Medusa was nice, though from the start, I was not a single issue feminist. Gail Rubin's sex gender system remains useful to this day for permutations and combinations. One of the nice things for me about feminism is that it doesn't, like Marxism, have a named book at the origin. A very general definition of work for feminism is to research how humankind is not nice to women and queers in different ways. <laughs> Isn't this a good definition? I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm not even saying violent. I'm not. Not nice. From, takes, from killing to passive aggressive behavior to laws, everything. Not nice in different ways. Um, and to see how this operates a structure of approved violence at one end and alibis for the interventionist missionary impulse at the other. It also allows feminism to mix with patriotism today as the world is undoing the rule of law. Leadership, role model, and indeed enforcement are the words we hear. Let us take a step back and assume for the moment, and you've heard me say this before, that culture is a set of largely unacknowledged assumptions held by a loosely outlined group of people mapping negotiations between the sacred and the profane and the relationship between the sexes, with sexual difference unevenly abstracted into gender gendering, because gender is our first instrument of abstraction, as I've said a million times. The gender gendering as the chief semiotic instrument of negotiation. Nationalism and religion come into play here, Gregory Bateson, in his early extremely important essay on play, enlarges the scope of what is to be included within the concept of learning by way of, I quote, hierarchic series which will consist of message, meta-message, meta-meta-message, and so on. This training, the bulwark of an aesthetic education, habitually fails with religion and nationalism. Bateson writes, up in the dim region where art, magic, and religion meet and overlap, human beings have evolved the metaphor that is meant, the flag which men will do to die to save, and, the, and not just men now, and the sacrament that is felt to be more than an outward and visible sign given unto us. It is interesting that Freud mentions the same two items, throne and altar, 
in fetishism as the monitors of fetishistic illogic. Play training and aesthetic education habitually fails with flag and sacrament, throne and altar. These are all coding ingredients at our disposal. Sexual differences, difference, and RHN are the irreducible. You can't go any upstream. Sexual difference and reproductive heteronormativity. I call it RHN, it's a big phrase. <laughs> Briefly, this is upstream from state queer trans. Hetero here is the antonym of auto. You know, uh, autonomy, heteronomy, that's what it is. For example, the queer use of childbearing is the extramoral use of difference, this difference, hetero. So that it's not just people take it, at, well, I won't ad lib. I got an email, uh, I don't need to ad lib. I got an email from one of my Italian translators today. I quote, the notion of reproductive heteronormativity, she writes, which as far as it seems, has never been translated into Italian yet. And <laughs> cute, eh? And uh, I'm going to find the Bengali phrase. I've, got, I've done antico ontological difference. I've got done all kinds of things. Anyway, has never been translated into Italian yet, and which would sound translated as it is as heteronormatività riproduttiva, not particularly clear. I think, I think it would be better reproduzione heteronormata, which would be closer to the idea of reproduction through traditional heterosexual intercourse. <laughs> My response, sorry, reproductive heteronormativity does not mean reproduction through traditional heterosexual intercourse. <laughs> the phrase is clumsy in English too. I hope you will preserve its awkwardness in Italian. <laughs> Responding to Helen Thomas's repeated question. So sexual difference and reproductive heteronormativity, they're irreducible. You can't go any further upstream. Uh, Responding to Helen Thomas's repeated question, why do they hate us? I've just written for, uh, in these times, a 600-word response. I'm just going to read a little bit of it because I want to come to something here. I'm just beginning my, what I wrote. In 1916, assuming they would win the war, France, Russia, and Britain divided up the remains of the 600-year-old Ottoman Empire, drawing frontiers, creating the Middle East. Everybody knows this here. Creating the Middle East. Lebanon and Iraq were directly controlled. Others kept in spheres of influence. Haifa, Gaza, and Jerusalem were an allied, quote, condominium. Arms control was strictly European. The Arab powers learned of this in 1917. At the end of the war, previous agreements among assuring Arab independence seem to have disappeared. The makings of a cultural memory. You know what I think about cultural memory. I talked about that in Stanford. I'm assuming that all of you were there, but uh, I just <laughs> talked about it day before yesterday. The Ottoman Empire was corrupt, but except for focused examples, such as the horrifying Armenian genocide, generally the carrier of an attitude of conflictual coexistence toward religious difference. Now, a master race that clearly thought itself justified in controlling and systematizing the locals without any social contract, often by remote control, stepped in. An inchoate resentment starts in people who cannot combat this palpable transformation at the ground level. I think also of Tijuana and San Diego. Uh, people who cannot combat this palpable transformation at the ground level. Now this is the sentence that I wanted to come to. Women feel this strongly, especially in traditional societies where they think of men as holding their dignity. And a lot of nonsense begins to start because the men also feel that this role of holding the dignity of women, et cetera, et cetera, okay. And so the cultural memory thickens. Now, I've been thinking about this because I am what I am. I'm interested in aesthetic education. I believe that this desire to place one's dignity in one's companion is not necessarily male. I see this and not necessarily traditional and not necessarily stupid. I see this, in fact, in my professional life all over the place among highly educated people that one place, and pe feminist folks, 
It has nothing to do with, in, a, in certain situations, the form of the thing is not a, 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 a gender corrupt thing at all. In certain situations, it becomes that. So the solution to this is not just simply to say, this is a bad tradition, become like me. But to notice that in the best, among the best of us, quite often, I mean, I am free of this one. I don't have a partner and happy not to have one. But, <laughs> the, uh, but uh, you know, I, do, I can't ask you to become like me. That's exactly what I'm criticizing. But I do, I do see all over the place, among my dearest and most intellectual friends, many signs, and I, I, um, I admire it, of placing dignity in the partner. They're placing their dignity in the partner. They will take anything, but the partner remains someone. You, so this, therefore, I felt that this, uh, this, this desire should be rearranged. You remember that's the humanities uh, education formula, the uncoercive rearrangement of desire. You have to be able to get into it. You can't just so, but of course, this can also accommodate violence. But what isn't medicine and poison at once if you are teaching use rather than simply doing good to others? You, uh, we know that almost anything worthwhile is medicine and poison at once. What we are taught is how to use it. Remember, again, if you were at Stanford yesterday when I was telling, uh, telling, uh, telling Ramon that Aristotle's uh, distinction or relationship between mimesis and poiesis will not work in my villages. I gotta make a distinction between imitating and making. I can't work with Aristotle because that one turns into poison. If I, a caste Hindu, tell them, do mimesis well and by tuche, poiesis will suddenly emerge, it won't apply. So therefore, this particular uh, thing, this business of putting one's dignity in the partner, that's not uh, that, that's medicine and poison. If you're teaching use and getting into it, then it's a different kind of ball game from just uh, teaching self-interest. What is the problem here? Indeterminacy, because violence is also part of desire, pleasure, education, but acknowledgement of violence distorts the mechanism unless framed within a whole other sociality. And in the matter of feminism, this is where the intuition of the transcendental comes in. Now, intuition of the transcendental is another word like reproductive heteronormativity. Plain prose cheats, so therefore I use these kinds of phrases that one has to explain. So the intuition of, you notice plain prose cheats and monosyllables, but at any rate, the um, intuition of the transcendental people invariably think I'm talking about the supernatural or about God and so on, or religion, no. I use this phrase to mean that I cannot provide evidence for my conviction. Kant theorizes this as transcendental deduction. We, since we are not philosophers like Kant, fully convinced of the evidentiality of our conviction. We know we are right. Fully convinced of the evidentiality of our conviction, still have inchoate feelings, generally disavowed, hence intuition, that there is something other than the evidentiary. Without this, we can neither mourn nor judge. How does this play with the rational judgment of democracy? Democracy as an abstraction matches the abstract structures of both capital and the state. So I'm saying that this one small thing, I'm not talking about a huge lot of gender training, feminism, Western feminist are bad, et cetera, nothing. Just that one little thing that uh, uh, placing, uh, uh, called traditional by people who don't have the time, they run off, placing the dignity in the, in, in the men, in the case of these people, but you can empty that word. So I'm just focused on one thing, I'm only a literary critic. The, um, so how does this play? I say that here you need the intuition of the transcendental. So, uh, and the intuition of the transcendental is something that says that there is something other than the evidentiary. How would this play with the rational judgment of democracy? Where you have to make an intended mistake and think that there's nothing but the evidentiary. So although even here the intuition of the transcendental can play, let's not go there. Democracy as an abstraction matches the abstract structures of both capital and the state. Capital, of course, has been allowed to win. 
because the strait has been complete. The state has been completely. Uh, I wish it were the strait, but no. The state. <laughs> the state has been completely disenfranchised, and the democracy has been made multicultural. I mean, lobbies. You can't. Democracy is a very harsh abstraction. You can't have, I mean, I'm thinking of people like Melissa Williams, lobbies within uh, democracy touted as a more uh, socially just multicultural situation. No, p perhaps in Canada. But, uh, but uh, that was a throwaway remark, forget it. Anyway, <laughs> multi so multicultural democracy and international civil society both applaud only the social productivity of capital and all structural constraints are lifted as obstacles and the needy are seen as individual occasions. Needy or groups of needy, okay. Whether Foucault is right or wrong, violence and alibi, remember that's where I began, that thing, that missionary impulse leads to both violence at one end and alibis for intervention at the other. Whether Foucault is right or wrong, no, no, not the missionaries, but this human uh, tendency to be not nice to, uh, to women and queer. Whether Foucault is right or wrong, violence and alibi are now turned into a chiasmus. Remember what Foucault says, that in the sub-individual field, uh, the, which is almost like an electric force field, there are these irreducible vis-a-vis, they're irreducible face-to-faces, which, uh, which get inhabited by certain kinds of pairs, whatever is at hand, and you have a power situation. Well, that's what's happened. Whether he's right or wrong, it serves as a form. Violence and alibi have become a chiasmus, rather than a critical pair, which would have been an asymmetrical riddle. I hope everybody in this audience has read Tilly Olson's book, Tell Me a Riddle, because that's what her book is about. Uh, which uh, violence and alibi are now turned into a chiasmus rather than a critical pair, which would have been an asymmetrical riddle that must leave space for an intuition of the transcendental. The dying old woman says, humanity, humanity, that, that's the intuition of the transcendental. You cannot mourn or judge without that one. I began with the autobiographical, and I want to end with the autobiographical, coming to the point that below the radar, you cannot choose only to, quote, empower women. Violence will not be undone this way. And that will be my final move, the, uh, the below the radar, what radar, you'll see. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, one of the people that I worked uh, with, very, very self-styled, feudal savior of uh, women, said to me, Gayatri, you must teach the women in these aboriginal areas how to read and write. And I said to her, you've forgotten that the men don't know how to read and write either. <laughs> in that situation, I mean, you do this for women when women are the objects of violence so that they have been kept from uh, uh, becoming literate. But that's not the situation here. Nobody knows how to read and write. This is, and I was told, for example, well, no, no ad-libbing. At any rate, so <laughs> what I'm saying that uh, is then, I, and that's where I'll end, below the radar. Think of my discussion of placing one's dignity in the other and contrast it now to two things. One, simply developing self-interest in the woman below. You, you put this one out saying, no, no male identification. This is not male identification. As I said, this is a form which does not have to have the other as, ma as male. It can become that within certain kinds of social formations. Engage with the social formation. Don't organize the women to lose this one. It's one of the, one of the deepest ethical supports of, of the human being as angled toward the other. Okay, so, the, so number one, simply developing self-interest in the woman below, and two, solving problems, Paula mentioned this, from above, production now, this is slightly new, of the global, not colonial subject. The global subject is different from the colonial subject, and I am uh, completely at odds with Saskia Sassen's notion. I was talking about the multitude and the arrival of Godot by himself, etc. So it's uh, Saskia Sassen's notion of the uh, global subject as, uh, as um, uh, labor export woman, I think has a, there's a lot to uh, worry about there. Anyway, so distinguish this, distinguish this, distinguish these two, developing self-interest in the woman below. And for this, you don't have to be Western. You just have to be a certain kind of quick fix do-gooder. You can be any color, 
any place. The production of the global, not colonial subject, distinguish it as locating need, not desire. Need, not desire. You know, that sentence in Du Bois, right after writing, writing about the situation right after emancipation. Yes, the Negro needs food and shelter, but must be taught now, I'm uh, not quoting exactly, how to communicate with the stars. That's not wait until they have enough to eat. This, this thing is desire, not need. To locate desire, to believe that the deprived have desire and not just need, is it requires such an incredible, incredible change that this is a good crowd. You love me, I hope. But <laughs> when, when, I speak, when I speak next week to Beijing Plus 15, if I, when I talk about this, I will have to think about how to say it so that people don't just not listen. That, you know, if you think about all of the world's women. So, there we go. I'm just now giving you, before I go to the autobiographical, asking you just to do, the, do it with this one thing. Because that's how literary people uh, work, right? There are lots of literary people here. Uh, yesterday, for example, I used one, uh, one sentence, Bengali sentence, Shadu hobi to boka hobi kano, which means you're going to be a saint, must you be a stupid person? Okay. <laughs> now, having, having explained this, I ended my talk with this sentence. And by then, the entire audience has, had learned that really rather useful, they'll forget, a rather useful Bengali word. So therefore, we focus on one thing. So I'm just focusing on that one thing, and I'm now focusing on just some notices that came down for just this week. OK, one of them, new special representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict appointed, Sweden's Margot Wallström. This is not a bad person. This is a wonderful person. She's Scandinavian. Therefore, remember how I situated myself? Think. Remember when, the, when uh, we wanted to say Nicaragua was all right? We used to say, well, it's really more like Sweden. It's really not like Cuba and so on. So, she's, so if, I, if, I, if I was produced the way I, I told you, you know, in Calcutta, because otherwise you think, oh, some oriental wonderful uh, place from where Gatti Spivak suddenly comes singing Bengali songs. But I... <laughs> I can sing Bengali songs, by the way. Judith knows. Don't, 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 don't take me there. I will waste your time. <laughs> but, uh, but um, no. So, so therefore, think of where she's coming from. So, when she says violence against women is the most common but least punished crime in the world, she's okay. It's good to punish people. But remember where I began. I began by saying that in Can the Subaltern Speak, the entire essay which changed my life and changed the direction of my work, what I saw was that a good law, which certainly was used for punishment, made in 1829, failed because there was no subjective involvement with training the imagination for epistemological performance. So therefore, yes, it's good that there should be enforcement, but doesn't go far. She will lobby for the recognition of sexual violence in war as a war crime, also excellent, first class. But the thing to do, and uh, the, uh, if you read Nayanika Mukherjee's book, uh, Coming Out of Duke, which will come out in a couple of months, I think you will see that my first my introduction into all of this was not can the subaltern speak, but when I had forgotten it, Nayanika, looking at those photos, actually brought that memory up. It had been buried. When I went with my mother in 1973 to Bangladesh, because she was a, a feminist worker, um, involving herself with the women, the so-called Birangonas, who had been raped in that, in that war. Now, this particular situation, yes, of course, you must declare it a war crime. But most of you here, literary folks, have read Ricoeur and know about what happens when a, a situation is turned into a case. We must have the law, but law is not justice. So therefore, once you declare something as something, that's, it's a wonderful thing. Legal activism is a first class thing, it's a good law. It's better to have it than not to have it, but that's a beginning, not an end. But we don't uh, agree on this when uh, we celebrate this. She added that increasing the role of women in decision-making processes will be a priority for her. With what do you decide? That's the question we are asking, right? The, the ones who work like we do, the ones who believe in aesthetic education for everyone, 
with what do you decide? And I'll talk about the quota system in India right at the end. For gender justice advocates, this SRSG appointment, says the notice, opens a vital channel of communication to the UN Secretary General, as SRSGs often conduct widespread consultations with various stakeholders, commitment to the challenges faced by women around the world. I will say right at the end that I cannot generalize. I just want you to look at this, just a week, and I will go to some of these things. And be nice, because I don't think the question is Gayatri Spivak opposes. That was, first of all, it's my friend Chandra Mohanty, not I. I could think I'm a Western intellectual born in India, but, uh, the, um, uh, but uh, it's not a question of opposing anyone here. It's really looking for some way out of this incredibly powerful missionary, uh, missionary instrument outside of all of these. Other, it's, it's a powerful thing, and I'm not against it but it won't last. So, then the second thing that came, the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace, and Security launches new monthly policy note. Okay, now I'm just gonna say one sentence. I'm sorry Nasira isn't here, because you know, I was in France very recently and talking about the situation of women in, um, in France, especially uh, uh, Muslim, young Muslim women, older Muslim women, etc. but here's the sentence. The February monthly action points includes an appeal to France, which currently holds the Security Council presidency, to honor its stated commitments to ensure that women's rights are upheld. This is really, for anybody who's involved there, it's really a derisive sentence. Again, I always say these are not bad things. I mean, it's better than shopping till you drop. But it's a, th these, are, these are good things. But when you consider how much money, how many arrangements are made in order for these sentences to come out, it really gives you some, uh, that's why I'm asking you to distinguish this from that one small thing that's easily destroyed, putting one's dignity in one's partner. Then uh, con the um, point to ways in which these reports should include important considerations relevant to the protection of women's rights, articulate a comprehensive strategy regarding sexual violence. These are abstract words. Training the imagination for epistemological performance is impossible with these hegemonic abstractions. Absolutely impossible. Possible, I assure you. So therefore, the, th that's why I'm just giving you a week's worth and then I'll move on to the more autobiography. The third thing is the European Union and NATO meet on women, peace and security. I hope all of you in this room have read the so-called European constitution, which really wasn't a constitution, it was for economic, uh, uh, economic uh, um, expediency, but and anyway, it wasn't approved. But nonetheless, there is, in the beginning, a description of Europe as achieved gender equality, which is incredibly scary. But anyway, <laughs> The EU's efforts will include a stepping up of the cooperation on women, peace, and security with the African Union. The EU will also intensify bilateral efforts towards governments and actors that bear responsibility and so on. So this is the missionary impulse. Good thing, a good thing. Please understand that this is, for me, to be involved in these kinds of legal things is not a bad thing. I would be, would be an idiot at the age of 68 if I said, forget all this. No, but all I'm trying to say is that some of you realize that this is a holding action at incredible expense and self-congratulation. And after a while, the dream itself enchants one, so that just reproducing this system, and I could give you many examples, but I'm not ad-libbing, many examples of how to keep the system going, especially by uh, ethnically um, appropriately visible women. This is also a very scary thing. So we come now to the last thing, and then I'll move on. Because, as I said, capital is right there. Hmm? So uh, then on March 3, a lunch, uh, um, annual meeting. Our special guest speaker is Ellen Iskanderian, President and CEO of Women's World Banking, the world's largest network of microfinance institutions and banks. And you know very well why it was the women who were given the money. You, do, you know that, don't you? It's an essentialist idea that women repay uh, loans uh, more quickly. It's a, it, that is of a piece with that this women find their dignity in men, etc. That can be used. Women are, quote, good, unquote. 
So um, I hope they're not. Uh, President, okay, so <laughs> the Women's World Banking was established following the first World Conference on Women held in Mexico City, 75. Since that time, they have been the leader in microcredit loans to women in development. Mrs. Kenderian, and you know this name just, I'm sorry, I mean, there are some people in this room, I'm sure, thinking about Alexander, but that's the name, right, Iskandar? It's a huge history that's probably an Armenian name. It's a subduing of Byzantium and so on and so forth. Anyway, forget it. That's just an old poetic person speaking. Mrs. Kanderian, who joined WWB in 2006, has more than 20 years of experience in building global financial systems. This is not the experience that we need <laughs> throughout, the de throughout the developing world. Mrs. Kanderian is a leading voice for women's leadership, remember what I said, and participation in microfinance. And a strong, microfinance is almost like self-immolation. You know, you do it, you do it, and then because nothing of the medicine poison attitude toward the use of capital. You know, I say to my, I've said this, and I hope there are some people here who understand Bengali. I've said this to Chandrakanta Dattu, who helps me with the, with my schools, and he, he was going on and on about how terrible Punjibad was, uh, uh, capitalism. And I said to him, I said, Chandrakanto, don't make a mistake. Punjibhalo, Punjibad kharap. Capital is good, capitalism is bad. So this business, of, but the, again, it's medicine and poison. You must know how to use it. So therefore, you don't get anything. I remember I, that it's the same point. The point about can the subaltern speak is not white men or anything. It's this one point that we teach use, we teach how to rather than, etc. If we don't, passing good laws and without this one doesn't do anything. Okay, so, um, uh, and then comes, okay, then she says, Ms. Iskanderian is a leading voice for women, etc., and a strong advocate for the role of capital markets in the sector. Like I said, only emphasizing the social productivity of capital with absolutely no attention paid at all at the other side. Even Marx believed in the social productivity of capital, so that's not a problem. But look what happened. So the, then uh, there's just one more, the National Council for Research on Women, whose motto, if it matters to women, it matters to everyone, as if women are completely monolithic. I thought only Islam was monolithized, but now I see. <laughs> So, and the council's mission is the National Council for Research on Women is a network of more than 100 leading US research advocacy and policy centers with a growing global reach. Harnesses the resources of its network to ensure fully informed debate policies and practices to build a more inclusive and equitable world for women and girls. They have from turbulence to transformation at Goldman Sachs. Now this, this is where they're meeting. <laughs> Remember what I said, I don't know if Sherya Moraga is in the audience, but uh, if she is, she said she would come very kindly. In 1978, the, the last time that we were at a conference together in Illinois, that's a long time ago, I was talking about exactly this, about a place, uh, about an organization called Plato, who completely decimated um, unorganized um, uh, Korean women workers, permanent casuals, and who were giving scholarships in the United States. And of course, we all know about Coca-Cola and Emory. Let's not, I had to leave in two years because I couldn't, it was hard for me anyway. So um, at Goldman Sachs, sponsored by Deloitte, at this critical, and this is what they write, at this critical yet promising moment in history, join our panel of visionary leaders for an in-depth exploration of the most pressing issues of our time. What are the challenges and opportunities for advancing real and substantive social change that creates a better world for women and girls? Credit deficit insurance, of course. Panelists will share their vision, strategies, and the action, thank you, steps needed to promote more equitable and inclusive societies, locally, nationally, and globally. This is the Red Riding Hood's grandmother. I mean, you know, it's really true. I mean, we say about Al-Qaeda constantly that they're killing people. The kind of, kind of harm globally that's been done by these folks, then to come in and say, look, we are going to give you visions and we are going to do good for women, this is the alibi thing. And so you have the uh, founding partner of the Circle Financial Group, Jackie Zayner, 
and uh, Edith um, um, something, I forget her name, she's in the, uh, Edith Cooper, Managing Director and Global Head of Human Capital, Man human capital Management, Goldman Sachs. There's a lot to say about human capital. This event, it says, is free. <laughs> There's no free event, is what I would say. This event is free and open to the public. RSVP is only required for security purposes. Of course it is, you know, in my school, the reason why I love my school, St. John's Diocesan Girls High School, because in 1926, it was a collegiate school, Vinadas, not Vinadas, Binadas, sorry, not our Vinadas. Binadas shot the governor at a prize giving ceremony, you see? So what the governor had needed, except the college part was closed. Uh, she was our hero. But uh, what the governor needed was the same RSVP that Goldman Sachs now knows to require for security purposes. <laughs> now comes my testimony as my stereotype to Frigga Haug. I put this in there to show that I'm not speaking, uh, are these just, just a passing week. This is, I mean, also I've taken about four from about 30, 40 things that come down the pike in a week, right? So I'm just trying to say, to give a sense of why, what it is that one confronts, and this is not a question of speaking against. I join, as I said, I will be speaking to them. Now, my testimony as my stereotype to Frigga Haug, she asked me to write about the engaged feminist intellectual, my, myself, she thought. So I wrote, <laughs> How feminist am I in my salaried work? How engaged, how intellectual? It seems to me that our first instance of engagement is in how we have chosen to support ourselves, even if unwillingly, because with that support, we think we can be engaged feminist intellectuals outside. I often think that feminism is in my bones, but what feminism is it that is in my bones? If I ponder about it in your pages, I will not be speaking about social engagement as a feminist. When it comes to social engagement, I repeat, you must think of how you have chosen to support yourself, because in spite of yourself, that is how you have, depending on what you have chosen, inserted yourself in the abstract circuit of capital, and the repercussions of your action determine your engaged work. If capital is the strongest agency of validation into modernity and has been since the 17th century when previous imperial formations and mercantile formations change into the capitalist mode of production, in this place I'm also held by a much older agency of validation, reproductive heteronormativity. Let us say that it is between these two, I'm repeating myself to anchor what I've said so far, Capitalism as modernity and reproductive heteronormativity as the chief recoding instrument of capital, thoroughly internalized, that the engagement of the feminist shuttles. The job is everybody's choice of a mode of living. Like many, quote, engaged persons, I also have another job which is outside of this choice. This is my engagement with maximal teacher training in backward areas of West Bengal, now for nearly 25 years. In the opening, I said that the instrumentalization of the salaried job for the propagation of the, quote, real job is not perhaps very intelligent. And we are speaking of the feminist intellectual. We must think through engagement in terms of the relationship or non-relationship between the two, quote, jobs. In my case, Colombia and Birbhum. If the relationship is to instrumentalize, then I think there is a reaction formation which wants to deny the often larger social role of the one unwillingly chosen, the job to support oneself. This applies to a salaried job as much as, much as it does to a feudal job such as marriage. Let us carefully think through the meaning of freedom of choice. Freedom of choice is something that is denied to race, class, gender compromised people. Therefore, in our activism, we cannot ignore freedom of choice as a desirable opportunity for which we must strive to build the best possible social and political infrastructures. But the freedom from oppression that spells out freedom of choice cannot be an end in itself, that those are the laws. 
We must keep in mind that the end is the freedom to be able to understand that an achieved juridical, legal, socio-political freedom of choice should allow the individual to realize that this concept metaphor has been, in the narrative of modernity, deeply imbricated with capitalism disguised as a pursuit of happiness. Alas, it is in the area of the unwillingly chosen and kept job that we, in fact, in our lives, act out the limits of freedom of choice. And this is where the truth of our engagement lies. Every one of you, suffer, well, probably if you're at Berkeley, suffering, for example, from the priority established in your budget. See, this is the, it's your freedom of choice, right? You're caught in that one. The, that we, in fact, in our lives, act out the limits of freedom of choice. And this is where the truth of our engagement lies. The, this irreducible compromise should tell us more about our engagement than the sustainable activism, the maximum of compromise in order to achieve the minimum of activism. That sustainability, a maximum of something, a minimum of something else. In order for what we recognize as feminism to operate as an engagement, we must presume socialist norms, which are written within capitalism. This is why I gave the story in the begin beginning, because it means turning the use of capital from capitalist to socialist, u socialist uses. Where there is no agency of turning, and the development of capitalism is not noticeable, except by the remotely victimized in Kuwaitly, for example, in those villages again, because of the price of oil going up, and I explained to them why the price was going up. And these are people who don't even have a sense of America. They think I'm the ruling class, which they're correct, uh, because I'm caste Hindu from Calcutta, not because I live in America. They know this, they know I live in America, but it's like the children have maps, but they don't have much of a, the maps are horrif horrible, first of all, and secondly, they don't really know uh, in spite of the best efforts, because the teachers don't know how to use books. So these pictures of you know people like smiling in their schools, it's really um, it, not, it really knives me in the gut. But at any rate, so um, in that kind of a situation where you know you so the oil was I explained. So what was happening? Nobody, the children could not study in the evening. Okay, this is a very remote thing. The uh, that in fact the education was completely destroyed because no one could buy oil. So that's, now that's a remote victimization, but they certainly don't know anything about this. So in those kinds of places, the uh, remotely, the task has been picked up today by the International Civil Society, if it has, which I have described as self-selected moral entrepreneurs on many occasions. These people are confident that gender redress can be computed in terms of making the phenomena of gendering accessible by general terms provided by world governance style documents, Every unit fought over in PrepCom meetings, everything most simply understood, as in a PowerPoint presentation, as in knowledge management plans, decisions made by logic rather than subject engagement. A certain kind of anti-capitalism, not invariably present in this sector, which is often dependent upon, and happily so, upon corporate funding, and how many people think fundraising is activism? No, fundraising is collecting money. Fu the, um, and happily so upon corporate funding, substitutes for a proactive socialism here. The slow and deep language learning that must accompany accessing cultural infrastructures so real long-term change might be envisaged is completely absent. The distinction between problem solving and the uncoercing, uncoercive rearrangement of desires between doctors without borders and primary healthcare, let us say, is often ignored here. This kind of feminist engagement is not noticeably intellectual if the intellectual is a person who analyzes the existing situation before choosing the most convenient instrument for solving a problem that has been constructed as a case by looking at the grid established by people in a completely different level of capitalist society. In this sort of below-the-radar rural situation in eastern India, at least, that is another problem. We tend to generalize too soon because of the alliances of the international civil society with the benevolent feudal feminism of the global south. The problem-solving approach can apply to clearly visible cases of domestic violence. Without maximal follow-up, with all the infrastructure in place hierarchically in local and district-level administration, and more important, without an engagement supported by deep language learning and a renunciation of the conviction of having the answers, with the millennially established structures of feeling and desires, 
Nothing achieved here will last when the engaged persons leave as they necessarily must. As for health and education in these areas, we must engage children rather than adults if we are to destabilize internalized accepted gender patterns of behavior and they must be destabilized at the same time as desires must be rearranged to develop intuitions of a democratic state. Even here, what other efforts the engaged intellectual might be able to bring to bear, remembering that the real change must be epistemic rather than merely epistemological, is offset by the development of ethical and epistemic semiosis at home cradled in an often traumatic child rearing which is so deeply involved in the lessons of millennial class apartheid and gender division that it is precisely of the part of the problem that one is trying to solve. So that, you know, I have these people from Calcutta, from, uh, I can name them, they go in to help, and they teach in the way we know that we should teach in middle class households with nice parents and that we're learning all over the place. <laughs> and of course the children are having a fine time, you know, I mean, children are children. But on the other hand, they learn nothing at all because they go home and then what I just described in that kind of turgid language, they, they just, and so therefore nothing comes. So what do you do? You can't traumatize them in the school. How do you, with your middle class presuppositions of how to behave with children, learn how to teach the teachers to use books so that they can teach the children while you are also teaching the children, which wouldn't be that sort of, is it a, I'm asked, is the Montessori method or is it the whatchamacallit method? No, I don't know what method, method it is. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't generalize. So therefore, the, um, it must be said, however, that the class apartheid here is more crippling than the gender divisions. As you enter the rural middle class, engendering shows its uglier face. Therefore, autobiographically and confessionally, I'm almost uh, done, rather than as an in, in an instructive mode, let me say that in the metropolis, encountering a sort of feminism that must itself fight with on-the-ground phallogocentrism, recently internalized post-feminism, mainstream gay movements reproducing the morphology of reproductive heteronormativity, continuing juridical legal fights, and confronting the underlying unexamined gender benevolence of the international civil society allied with the feudality of the global south, I encounter upon the rural floor a situation where involvement with women is pleasant. But their delighted reaction cannot be taken as evidence of the success of engagement. And therefore, giving time, skill, undermined by repeated mistakes, because human equality as human sameness is too easily assumed, my feminist engagement goes into a pre-active moment so that male and female children can learn simply to be the same and different, starting from nothing but having been born by phallus and the vagina, with phallus and vagina themselves, nourished by breast by guile, protected and destroyed by physical violence and subservience. And then I wrote to her, if I, if I must end out now, if I don't get packed, I miss my train. These are regular 10-day trips of intense labor remain bookended by the salaried work and the lecture circuits that provide the travel. I take pleasure in being validated by the absence of financial recognition from the other end, and I have to, even if you're dying of heat. I am too. Look how I'm sweating. The, in fact, I could take this off, couldn't I? But uh, uh, the, um, I have to read what I wrote to the IRS, okay? Because <laughs> the IRS, please don't mind. This is not ad-libbing, and this is in the third person, Spivak, okay? So the IRS audits me every year. Because I'm an Indian citizen, I use foreign money to train uh, children in rural areas. What does it sound like? Not good, eh? So, <laughs> so, so therefore, I'm, I'm, so one year I wrote them this, okay? So I wrote. Uh, so uh, the, I called it Village Research Project. Okay, no grant proposals written to preserve intellectual freedom. Professor Spivak, I'm writing, Professor Spivak's project relates to the fact that national liberation does not always lead to a good and democratic society. Can you imagine the IRS? <laughs> <coughs> current, current research in the area, Farid, Zakaria, Jack Snyder, etc., states that no society below a certain per, per capita level is, quote, ready for democracy. 
Zac Zakaria Snyder and others in the field are social scientists. Professor Spivak's research relating to the work of such rare thinkers as John Sawati in Kenya investigates the reason for this. The reason for their being social scientists, badly written. <laughs> typically, typically, a newly liberated country in the absence of established infrastructure is obliged to put planning and development in the hands of a vanguard. In the absence of a people educated in the habits of democracy, there are no constraints upon the vanguard, and social scientists declare the place unready for democracy. The generosity of human rights NGOs does not confront this problem, but perceives education as a human right. Typically, such work ends in fundraising, building schools, providing textbooks, and making this part of peacekeeping enforcement. Spivak insists that focus must be placed on the quality of the education. There are three points here. A, without deep language learning and long-term effort, no cultural infrastructures can be accessed. Here, Spivak's salaried work. She has been teaching full-time at US universities for 45 years as member of the Institute of Comparative Literature and Society with its insistence on deep language learning ignored in today's speed-oriented globalized world joins her rural research. B, the current quantified tests for educational success are unable to assess results here. C, because these largest sectors of the electorate have been oppressed sometimes for millennia, as in the case of India, their cognitive mechanism has been damaged, and educational generalizations such as Dewey's or Montessori's do not apply. Work such as Paulo Freire's early attempts relates to making populations aware of oppression. Freire's word is conscientization. Spivak believes, they actually forgave me that year. Spivak believes that democratic, I have the letter. Spivak believes that democratic habits and the intuitions of citizenship are developed in children under such difficult circumstances by changing their intellectual habits rather than developing political movements. In order to bring this about, Spivak is also interested in developing green habits in extreme poverty and interacting with state leaders and the rural gentry to see how such educational efforts can be stabilized. Under Spivak's research guidance, such efforts are being initiated also in Senegal. Currently, Spivak, Spivak's research base is seven hamlets. On each research visit, Spivak participates in two training sessions per hamlet and meets with educators collectively on the final day to assess progress. Some time is spent in social interaction and monitoring, quote, green habits. This immense project is not yet well developed enough to result in direct publication, but incidental publication is all over the place. I don't, I don't have the time because they had wanted it, my tax accountant told me, tell them what you do every day. It's a hilarious list of what I do every day, but that would really already have taken longer than I should, so I won't read it. But it's just, it's truly hilarious. But anyway, so, um, so that's that. So as I mentioned above, apart from insisting whenever possible that the girls and the boys receive equal attention and some other interventions of which I cannot speak, I can do little at the level of the children. I have two wonderful women teachers, both of whom are from poor rural gentry, uneasily cooperating against the deeply ingrained prejudices of their origins. I com uh, commend them in this. I may even go so far as to say I love them. On the level of the rural adult female population, there are the two wives of the adult males most active in these circles who had come forward in the beginning to befriend me by serving me hand and foot, because that's what they have millennially been trained for, these low-caste, quote-unquote, women, right? I'm a Brahmin, quote-unquote. So obviously, they, would, they came for, oh, sister, sister. Okay, so serve me hand and foot. They were women of good faith from the lowest stratum of village life. I let them sleep in my own bed under the same mosquito net, a most unusual one of, I, know, I hate it, three people in a little bed, a most unusual one of, kind, one of a kind piece of behavior to which they acceded. But I felt increasingly that I had to incur a lot of unnecessary expense so that they could come to the various schools, really as a way to visit other villages that were not open to them, and that otherwise this was a convenience for cooking for all of us. With great ambivalence, at a certain point, I asked them not to come to the committee house anymore, and of course they were hurt. Yet my friendship with them continued because one of my schools was in their residential hamlets. I have now instituted the practice of, quote, inviting them at the final day's general training meeting for all the teachers, followed by lunch. They enjoy the fact, and we laugh all the time, that they sit in chairs with me chatting while the men cook. And we point, this is a complete uh, change. It's nothing. But nonetheless, it's very unusual. It would be unusual even in middle-class households, the class to which I belong. 
they sit in chairs with me, and they're sitting in chairs with me. I mean, this is an unthinkable thing, a sort of village people outside. This is nothing, but nonetheless, it's really also quite something. So they sit in chairs with me, chatting while the men cook, and we point this out repeatedly, laughing. Is this anything? My answer, nothing. The government has programs for quota women, you know, like women must decide, about which there is research and experience showing that although the practice should continue, it is at the moment so much in the hands of powerful men that it is the kind of supplementing that we are practicing that will change the situation in the remote to distant future. Examples of exceptional women can be brought forward. I congratulate them and befriend them when I can. But following Audrey and Rich's commencement address to Smith College in 1979, I repeat the valuable lesson that exceptional women do not prove the rules, so much for leadership training. Otherwise, there are projects for so-called self-help groups toward opening individual bank accounts. The government calls them self-help groups. Opening bank accounts as an end in itself and then engaging in tasks of cottage industry or general rural activities are not uh, bringing, are not bringing in the sort of feminist systemic changes that we are thinking about. Remember, I have a great deal of experience here. In the meantime, the more energetic of the two women I'm speaking of, deeply cradled in reproductive heteronormativity, is often angry with me because I sacked one of her sons, now two of her sons, <laughs> from the position of teacher after they had harmed the children through many, many months of inefficient teaching. Remember, this is what I was talking about right in the beginning, placing... Uh, the, uh, your dignity in the men. So this is not a good example. So I'm not a romantic. I'm not saying it must be kept. It, that desire must be rearranged as I try to in the Columbia classroom, uncoercively. So I sat. I've just been obliged to discuss her, the bad teaching of the second one because he, all he wants to do is through country town level spoken English computer training, he wants to rise. That is a pitiful employment preparation, but who can blame him? He'll never get anything. He pays no attention to the children at all. Teaches, he taught them with dismissal and impatience. The woman is once again tremendously angry with me because she can perceive this only as a blow to her self-esteem, drawing her identity from her husband, a low-level factotum at the Communist Party office, and from her sons. I consider the fact of her being able to express this anger a step forward in establishing equality. With this absurd story of the limits to single-issue feminism, I close these hesitant remarks drawn from my last instance, instance. Let my closing words be then, my repeated frustration, also the condition of possibility for all my work now. I cannot generalize. And then what holds the entire gender mechanism as it is held by it, this is the only generalization I'm, I can make, other people's children. I explained yesterday that my ideas about disciplinary change in rethinking comparativism are also based on other people's children. I want to understand, and those of you who were there yesterday, I'm just going to quote this bit and then end. Um, it bears repeating for me. I want to understand something, understanding everything is impossible, about bypassing the necessity of good rich people solving the world's problems. Good rich people are dependent on bad people for the money they use to do this. And the good rich, those are the, those are the weekly things that I just read about, okay? I'm saying it simply. And the good rich people's money mostly goes to bad rich people. Beggars receive material goods to some degree and remain beggars. My desire is to produce problem solvers rather than solve problems. In order to do desire, in order to do this, I must continue to teach teachers current and future with devotion and concentration at the schools that produce the good rich people, Columbia University, and the beggars, seven unnamed elementary schools in rural Birbhum, a district in West Bengal, this work cannot be done with an interpreter, and India is multilingual. I must understand their desires, not their needs, and with understanding and love, try to shift them. That is education in the humanities. I've only recently been invited to participate in the elite tertiary and post-tertiary institutions in India, where English, which I believe is also an Indian language, can be understood. Although I feel most at home there because of the presence of critical intelligence, I cannot linger there precisely for that reason. That is the home of urban activism. If before I die, there is even one student who develops something like democratic judgment, quite different from justified self-interest against oppression from all sides, there is perhaps hope. There was such a boy, and Ramon Saldivar is not here today, but in fact, this is the boy of Minanda. There is a boy. 
There was such a boy in another area in an even more, quote, backward district where I started these efforts. The local ex-feudal chief closed the four schools there in my absence, destroying 20 years' work because nothing threatened this good, rich local despot than judgment among those whose problems he solved. The boy had not advanced far enough to retain what had only just begun. He has fallen back now into the ranks of the rural destitutes. The life of my exemplary local assistant has been destroyed. This is the area among these children, other people's children, that I fall into the most unacceptable kind of identitarianism, because one must begin in error. I am a woman, therefore women. Teachers, women students, this is, my, this is the formula there. I won't say it to you, but there. I'm a woman, therefore women. You work it out, thank you. now have questions? Everybody's allowed to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Pathetic. I'm going to sit down. Is, is it okay if I don't speak to the mic? Have a no, it's not available, sir. I, speak to the mic. I can speak to the mic. Oh. Can we move the mic? <laughs> no, it's Muhammad and the mountain. I'm taking pleasure in, for once, uh, playing the role of the mountain. <laughs> um, two of the ideas you put forward, um, locating desire rather than need, and disinvesting one's dignity from one's partner, resonated very strongly with a lot of the, the writing and the work I'm doing around consent and coercion, and redefining consent and changing the language of consent to the presence of enthusiastic yes, as opposed to the absence of no. And I wonder if you see that connection, if you see a connection, and what your thoughts are about that. I certainly see a connection. I don't work on consent because it's a very scary word for me, right? So, uh, the, but uh, yes, of course I do. But the, uh, the, what was the first idea? Um, locating desire. Okay, well, you know this locating desire, it's a very hard thing I'm saying there. It, it, there's really no way of locating desire, you know? I mean, uh, please understand this. I mean, what is that? Wild psychoanalysis? It's a, 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 what you have to do, it's like, you know how students, uh, many of you are teachers here, uh, and students uh, hear this and be warned. In many, you know, I love my students, all right? I think one should love one's students, like marriage, it's a contract, isn't it? So one should love one's students, but it's a very peculiar kind of love because a student is not really a human being. <laughs> the, a st the, student, the student is a student. See, it's like what De Paul DeMand said to Mike Abrams in my defense exam. You know, when Mike, Mike said to Paul, defense of, well, not my self-defense, defense of my uh, dissertation. <laughs> so, I was defending, yeah. but so uh, Paul Demand says to, uh, Mike Abrams says to Paul Demand, Paul, you have to agree because Mike Abrams believed that Paul Demand thought there was no reality, et cetera, right? Which he was wrong. But anyway, he says, you must agree that that is a half open window there. That window is half open. And so Demand said, Mike, that's not a window, that's an example. So that's called, th that's called the aporia of exemplarity. That's what the student inhabits as they come and go. I mean, you know, so to an extent, when you, when you begin to think about something as, as fungible as desire, you are really, it's a word that is somewhat like, it is more understandable if you look at the antonym, which is needs. See what I mean? So to an extent, I am, although I say this, it's a very, and, but what is easy? That's my question. What the hell is easy except falling off a log? The so <laughs> growing old, that ain't easy. So you see, so therefore I would say yes, but because 
uh, it's, I can't really locate it like ta 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 Very broadly, I make generalizations and kind of move along. And also, it's not locating that's important. It's rearranging and shifting that's important, right? And the rearranging and shifting does not come through talking about it. I mean, when you're dealing in these classes with, I mean, nobody here, Shomu is not here, and Ben Baer is not here either. Those are the two people who uh, share American life and that life. I mean, the idea I once said to Ben, Ben, can you imagine, because Eduardo had said to me, Kadava, when Princeton was making me an offer, can't you uh, somehow include, as I'm never going to teach so much, Eduardo, so can't you include your Indian thing in the Princeton thing? So Ben teaches at Princeton, right? So Ben was there, I said, Ben, can you imagine, imagine including this in the Princeton thing, and we just died laughing. So in that kind of a situation, locating desire is an almost, I mean, there's more cultural difference between them and me, metropolitan Calcutta, than there is between everybody in this room and me. You know what I mean? We share the academic culture from the day we, were, we entered school. So yeah, locating desire is a good phrase, but, and I certainly used it. But I'm not really, uh, I'm not stable and good there because the, the real thing is the shifting. I assume there are desires and I kind of, uh, go by uh, the antonym of need and so on, you know. Anyway, as for the other one, the, um, you know, that was just, to quote a demand, that was just an example. I'm not backing it or anything. Remember I said I'm free of it? But uh, I'm not backing it. I'm just saying there. I chose that one because I happened to write about it in terms of the development of... Uh, this hatred uh, that Helen Thomas had asked about when uh, they were discussing Al Qaeda in the in the White House. So uh, therefore, I used it. Uh, so there are others also. I, it's not part of my work or anything, and I don't either endorse it or not endorse it. I've, I'm, what I was saying was that I've noticed it in very um, politically solid. Uh, folks, and therefore I know that it's not tied to bad gender politics. The desire to fill it with bad gender politics is the one that should be changed, or not changed, so it's shifted, but in order for a desire to be shifted, the person has the responsibility of creating a situation or infrastructure where such a shifted desire, that's why this whole business, I mean, this comes, then we have to talk about the politics of Israel. We don't just talk about my supporting this way of being. I'm not particularly supporting it. I'm just saying that it's one kind of affective example which the quick worker would just simply destroy, saying to the traditional woman, don't find your identity in the man, what you? And so, and just create a kind of self-interest as in the case of the law against sati. And then when somebody actually shows that she is not invested in just a man, hangs herself after menstruating, they can't even recognize it. Remember, old story. I'm still there. So that's what I was saying, that it's, it was an example. It, it isn't part of my central focus, but I certainly recognize the resonances. I'm glad you spoke of it. Yes, there are questions, yeah. I mean, since she made me stand here, I want to hear her question. Better be good. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, I'm joking. Thank you for, um, I'm joking. from KPFA Radio, and thank you for allowing us to tape this. Um, so I don't have an intellectual question. I have a very basic question, <laughs> which is how do you, um, could you give an example of in the teaching of how you would engage a subject in a, um, in a, in a way that you are saying that's um, not, uh, how do you engage the subject? And can you give an example from the teaching that might uh, explain that? I can't really describe it, but I'll give you an example which I have given in, uh, in Stanford. It's, a, it's not a good, uh, wonderful example, okay? Like the one that you discussed. Remember, it's only an example, okay? But b because this kind of a situation is very hard to describe. It's very, uh, that's why I haven't written any books about it. You know, I can't generalize. 
very hard to describe. So therefore, what I'll do is, is that Judy leaving? Okay, <laughs> bye bye. Okay, good. So, uh, okay, I'll say what, uh, I'll say what, uh, she lifts up my standards in a certain way, see? But uh, <laughs> that's all. Uh, I'm very, very intellectually insecure, but Trinity Minha is still sitting there and some others. <laughs> okay, so, so um, at any rate, there's, to go back, I'll just give you an example, okay, but this is not a good example. I gave it before. Uh, this, my uh, mother tongue is one which uses diacritical marks, okay? R, uh, E, like that, okay? There's a consonant and then there's a diacritical. So I'm, I'll use my own name as an example because it will be more amusing. It will be, for example, spelled this way. You begin with the ga, the consonant ga, and then you put the arm ah sign on it, and so it becomes ga. And then you have the semi-vowel yaw, which doesn't take anything. And then, you, in order to get the three, you begin with the ta, the consonant ta. And then you put a raw mark on it, so it becomes tra. And then you put an e mark, the deep e mark on it, and it becomes three. And you have gaia three. So that's how you spell. Now, when we were, and the word for spelling is banan, which is in the, uh, it's a very old word, so therefore the last uh, consonant is stopped, but it's actually a, ger a gerund, which means making, poiesis. So, banan, okay? So, the, in our uh, uh, good middle class schools, we were taught to spell with uh, uh, actually uttering, just the way I spelled, uttering the change in the, in the, in the letter as you're adding the diacritical mark, and then finally uttering the whole word. In, uh, so, gaya kare ga, untustho, toy rafolai, this goi kare three, gaya three. That's how it will be, okay? That's how you spell it. In these uh, cognitively harmed places, uh, for us, what they do is they just teach both the teachers and the students just to describe this. Gaya kar, untustho, toy rafolai, this goi kare. Neither what is happening with each letter, nor the whole word, okay? So in, in sometimes when the government uh, prints proclamations for this and that, get rice, et cetera, even for people who have graduated high school, we have to go in a Jeep to read the damn thing for them. Because, first of all, the government uses difficult language. You people think we use difficult language. The government uses difficult language. And second of all, they can't read really because they never learned this way to spell. This also helps with English, by the way. They, this, they never learned to spell this way where what they're learning is how to make words rather than, so I say to them, look, in our wonderful language, there are so many words, you will never be able to learn the spelling of all, all, all the words. And they don't know that the word banan means making. So I say to them, look, look, look here, this word means making. So just teach spelling this way. Just 25 years, they're still not quite there because you know, I, don't, uh, I, I don't teach them to obey me. I try to uh, teach them that this is really not just an insignif insignificant thing that this old woman likes, you know? So, therefore, and since no teacher ever has taught them this way in those horrible class apartheid schools where the primary school teachers don't care, they won't do it. And so therefore, that's an example. I mean, I could give you more examples. Oh, oh, another wonderful example, excuse me. I don't feel so hot anymore because so this is, uh, this is bad for you. Uh, the, um, <laughs> Another wonderful example is the decimal system. The decimal system, they believe, is, and I have support from head teachers in that area who, by the way, quite happily do workshops with DFID, other NGOs, etc. And they say the workshops are nonsense. And out of these workshops, you get in journals like seminar and so on, statistics that show how wonderfully things are happening. This is why I was so rude this afternoon. So, the, uh, the, so they come, because of course, I mean, these are, they like uh, having these workshops with these people. And so the teachers go and do their workshops. Some do quite well. And then they come back to the schools, in, they never do anything because the people who are organizing the workshops also have no idea what these classrooms are like and how little these teachers will teach. And then Amartya Sen comes in and says, make private tuition illegal. It's a joke. It's like saying, you know, don't drink Coke. So anyway, so uh, therefore, the, in this kind of situation, they believe that the decimal system 
is a joke and an absurdity visited by the ruling class upon them. So the, what they do with the decimal system is just put the dot here, put the dot there, etc. <laughs> Nobody knows anything. And you cannot, you cannot get into the science stream, which will allow them to break out into the general society, unless in class three, you begin to understand fractions in the decimal system. And believe me, I believe in humanity's teaching. Eh? I teach the poetry of the decimal system. I, people come and sit down all around me. I mean, it was, found, it was supposedly established in India, right? And I say, and they, they have never known, these are teachers, they have never known that the damn dis decimal system, long, long before there were instruments for such small calibration, because you see how excited I'm becoming. There, there were instruments for such calibration. They said to themselves, we'll measure more, more, more. I said, come on, another zero. See what happens. They see even smaller. And there are no machines. So, I mean, the human imagination. And I say to them that, no, see, these people don't allow you to do intellectual labor. And you see, once you do that, once you start making your head work rather than just your body, you'll see what happens. That's why they're so scared. And so the poetry of the decimal system, that's become like an unbelievable thing. Because and I really, my best skills of hamming come into teaching f uh, the fractions, and, and not just to a single school. People come, like this, this uh, IRS. I mean, when I was starting to describe to them, look, I'm something you've never met a human. It's not true. I mean, I'm foreign, which is the problem really there. The human a foreign humanities person who's in the fast lane. So people all in their little in their little cubicles they came to here. What is she talking about? I took, took my Vita, like you said, 63 pages. But, and I said, you see, you see, you see, it went there's snow, I'm not getting any income enhancement. You see this? With no income enhancement. That's why I'm claiming travel, don't you understand? Etc. So the same, same kind of thing happens with the decimal system. And then my teachers, who are, you know, not qualified or anything, right? They actually go and tell other people that, you know, this is what the other masters, other teachers, you know, this is what the decimal system is. And say, come on, go away. How do you know? You're not even high school graduate. Say, just listen to me. You see what I mean? So that's another, I'd forgotten the decimal system. But that's, the, the decimal system is one of those. Very good thing. Thank you very much for, for, for the lecture. It was, um, it was fascinating, and somehow I can't really directly refer to it since uh, it just happened a moment ago. Can I ago. interrupt you just one minute? Would you now ask me questions about other things? You, you know, this focus just on these kinds of uh, helping others type schools? I do a lot of other things too, and I talked about a lot of other things <laughs> in the in the in the talk, okay? So I'd be glad if the further talks are not just about these village schools where you'll never go. That, I mean, uh, and about which I will never write books, yes. Um, my intention was actually to ask you about love. Love? Yes. So I, Is yeah. a many splendid <laughs> thing. <laughs> so you can sing, that's wonderful, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't not, okay, ask away. Awesome. So, um, yeah, the question is, because you were mentioning, also answering some of the questions, you were mentioning uh, the more like difficult parts of teaching. And, I mean, I was thinking about your text on translation and the politics of translation. And I was thinking of this like lovingly element of translating and translator's practice. Did I say that? Um, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I'll say anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> translation no, is so hard. <laughs> anyway, carry on. Somehow, somehow, I don't know. I mean, what? First of all, would you? And there is also Socrates and his practice of teaching, um, and the approach of like I'm sharing knowledge via. I'm better looking than Socrates. Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I really do think so. But carry on. No, but my question is sort of, sort of, not. It's not simple actually, but it's, it's about. How would you uh, refer to the, top, the element of love in education and whether it plays any role and what, how would you describe it, define it? Um, I mean, you already did somehow, but 
I, I'm curious. You know, I have to sing another song. <laughs> this, love is just a four-letter word, <laughs> because that's what it is for me. It's just a word. I don't know what it means. It describes, it describes an absence of the other affects. The other ones, you know, this kind of avoiding coercion, uh, the, that's a real effort. Hanging suspended, that's a real effort, you know, so that you don't actually go in thinking you know, but you try to, you try to see, I mean, I'm muscle bound with uh, education and qualifications and so on. And so I try to see uh, what the hell I should do the next step. Those are real, those are real nameable affects, learning from below, this and that. But something happens which you, that, that's that intuition of the transcendental. I cannot really produce an evidentiary thing about, I mean, it's a very irritating kind of thing, you know, not just this, but also teaching at Columbia. It's a, I don't like to teach. This is a very, this is a thing that people don't believe. But uh, it's, it's somehow, on the other hand, there is some sense that there must be something beyond evidentiary because it's clearly not just earning a living. If that was so, the other place would. It's like, extremely inconvenient. So to an extent, and also to be attached to people whom I often don't like, you know, uh, the uh, students, in other words. So, <laughs> and yet to be attached to care, you know, all of that stuff, which is nothing else, I have this word, which serves and pleases. You see, so it's in the place of that intuition of the transcendental in my sense. Something for which I cannot bring evidentiality. I mean, love didn't work, whatever the hell that is, in my life. You know, alone I am. And I'm not particularly into self-love either. I'm quite prepared to die. So it seems to me that the named thing is, and all the objects of my love are slowly uh, but uh, so the named thing I can't describe really, but this is the name of a place where the uh, named efforts and affects seem to find their limit. Uh, that's why I was clowning because, uh, see what I mean? <laughs> yeah, what else? Okay, I'm sorry, we have time for only one more and it looks like it's going to be right. Professor Spivak, uh, thank you. Uh, I would um, say this in Bengali. Uh, I would like to go to those villages. I, I'm a student, and I'm, but I think that being a student is not enough for me, at least. And I would like to hear what you think about that, being engaged as a student. What does that mean? It doesn't. Uh, it's OK. I mean, there was, <laughs> it's OK. I took someone called, uh, in fact, some of you know her, Mrinalini Chakravuti, last uh, time I went, and I think she was disappointed and I was disappointed. I mean, you have to know, I mean, you know, it's not, uh, I mean, to want to go there is, I think, quite, uh, quite, um, quite uh, understandable, and I like that. But it's not uh, really uh, anything exciting unless you really know Bangla absolutely backwards, not backwards, because you're teaching very small children complicated subjects and uh, children who come from completely illiterate backgrounds in villages. It isn't just the sort of fancy Bengali that you learn. In fact, that's, that, this is something that Ben, that, that's what I was talking about, deep language learning. This is something that Ben, you know, Ben is fantastic. He's a white English guy who's learned Bengali well enough that he uh, is publishing an account of an analysis of Tara Shankar's Hashili Banke Rupakata in PMLA. But I've told Ben again and again, and Ben knows, I said, Ben, you think that I'm joking, that I was just being politically correct before when I said that you have to know the language much better to do this work than to write scholarly prose. You thought I was just being, you know, nice. But now you know what I mean. Your Bengali is good enough to get published in PMLA. It ain't good enough yet to be teaching here. Because, you know, they won't understand and you cannot be at all kind of loving and nice. No photo ops. So, but what can you be? That thing that you can't be is called love in my vocabulary, but it ain't loving. 
So what do you say? You know? And I'm also embarrassed. So yes, of course, you can come, but it's not. Also, you have to, I mean, the conditions of living are extremely, extremely awful. But uh, that says it may be. I mean, I never say no to people who, in, if they don't know either Bengali or Hindi, I will say no, because I've never spoken there in, a, in any other lang any language that they don't understand. That's uh, really, that kind of changes the entire thing if you're speaking to someone. In, uh, it's, a, it's a very different thing. But anyway, you know, that's fine. But love, uh, let me just also say this. It's a very important question, yes? I'm also embarrassed sometimes by just the colloquial description of love, proof of it, you know? It's a, it's a very embarrassing thing. And, the, you know, this, I mean, I really am a hard-hearted person. Believe me, I'm not someone who's giving back or helping. I mean, I find that those, all those discourses really deeply stupid. I, 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 I mean, I can't say any word which is stronger than that, right? So uh, I think that any person who thinks that somehow by divine intervention he or she has become ready to help going from here should have their heads examined. Not any other part, <laughs> heads. But at any rate, that's a very different thing. But, uh, but sometimes you find suddenly you show physical sign of something to the, I don't even like children very much. Sometimes you show physical signs of something to a child, which embarrassingly looks like an expression of love. <laughs> That's a mystery. But uh, I must say that it's also not a bad moment. So you can, you can Think what you like about it. It doesn't happen very often. I'm not Christ-like. But it has happened a couple times in 25 years. <laughs> you know, it's a mystery. I can see the boy and, and another girl. Uh, there you are. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>